A family of seven sits down to eat some leftovers for dinner one evening. They've saved some pasta salad from a picnic they had on the weekend. It smells a little funny, so three of the children only eat a small portion, but it would be wasteful to throw it away. So it should be fine, right? Unfortunately not, for in a short six hours, all five children will be hospitalized. After what everyone thought was just a simple dinner, finishing off some leftovers to make sure nothing was wasted quickly devolved into bouts of vomiting, labored breathing, and a fight for their children's very lives. Let's get into it! After a picnic in the park on a Friday circa 2003, five children became sick after eating leftover pasta salad their family had saved until the following Monday. The salad smelled funny, so three of the kids, two girls aged 9 and 10, and a boy aged 14, only ate a little bit. Shortly after finishing the salad, about six hours later, the youngest girl, aged 7, began vomiting. Suddenly, her breathing became labored. She was taken immediately to the emergency room of a local hospital. But as they arrived, the rest of the children began to throw up as well. The youngest girl and her nine-year-old brother's breathing worsened quickly, so medical staff intubated them and got them on mechanical ventilators. All of the children were then transported to the University Hospital in Leuven, but during transfer, the youngest girl experienced a severe pulmonary hemorrhage which meant that blood was leaking into her airways, and paramedics were forced to apply continuous resuscitation to keep her alive. When she arrived at the Leuven Hospital, she was near death, in a coma, with internal bleeding and intense muscle cramps. Unfortunately, there was nothing doctors could do, and she died after 20 minutes of arriving at the University Hospital, only 13 hours after eating the pasta salad. The salad was made on a Friday before being taken to the picnic the next day. Unfinished, they brought the salad home and kept it in the fridge until Monday night when it was served to everyone. You probably smell fine, but thanks to today's sponsor, Scentbird, you can smell fine. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription service that lets you test out colognes and perfumes from over 600 brands in just a click. You can even skip a month if the scents don't speak to you with no penalties. Pick a new fragrance to try each month for only $16. Scentbird offers top designer brands like Tom Ford, Prada, and Versace. They even carry indie labels like The Harmonist, Confession of a Rebel, and Vince Camuto. Scentbird will customize your scents based on previous purchases and a short quiz on their website. One way or another, you'll find a smell you love. This month, we got Tommy Bahama Maritime Deep Blue. It felt really fresh and clean, kind of like just stepping out of the shower. It was reminiscent of a relaxing summer vacation, and it was our favorite out of the three. We also got the Mercedes-Benz Man, which was a little stronger than Deep Blue, but giving out a fancy schmancy vibe. You'd wear this if you go on dates or maybe even to attend a friend's wedding, though hopefully you'd just watch the wedding video instead. <laughs> the last one we got was Stem by Malin and Getz. This one felt really smooth like you're stepping into a florist's. It's got a nice, gentle smell, but lasts super long. It's a perfect scent for someone who likes to chill. With Scentbird, you get a 30-day supply for only $16, so you don't have to spend money on entire bottles you won't ever finish. You get to test out fragrances before you buy full-size bottles. Oh, and FYI, Scentbird fragrances come in cool little bottles that are both colorful and stylish, so you can look cool and smell amazing. Bottles of perfume can cost upwards of $150, but with our Scentbird discount, you can get luxury scents for just $7. Use our coupon code BRUISE55 to get 55% off your first Scentbird order. All of the siblings were affected by the ailment, though to different severities. The nine-year-old boy was taken to the pediatric ICU, where he was ventilated and monitored. They treated him for liver failure with lactulose, neomycin, and acetylcysteine. He regained consciousness and was successfully extubated with no other major complications. The elder two sisters were treated with fluid resuscitation and recovered slowly. 
The eldest brother was affected less severely than the others and was kept under observation. His blood samples came back good, and he, along with the surviving brothers and sisters, were allowed to leave after eight days in the hospital. In another case involving leftovers, a 17-year-old boy and his father came down with a bout of vomiting 30 minutes after eating spaghetti served with homemade pesto. It was made about four days prior and put into the fridge. However, it was left out at room temperature multiple times for up to two hours at a time before it was reheated and served. The spaghetti had an odor, but they ate all of it. However, the son ate more than his father. The father was a doctor, so coming down with abdominal pain and diarrhea about 30 minutes after eating, he took a course of antiemetics and charcoal to help his vomiting. He stabilized, but his son, who didn't have diarrhea, continued vomiting so badly he could not keep his charcoal down despite being given anti-emetic meds. The son's condition slowly deteriorated over the next two days. His father treated him with aspirin, acetaminophen, and other medications. The efforts were in vain, however. His son became fatigued and listless. He was taken to the hospital, where doctors found him to be jaundiced, his skin and eyes yellowed, as well as suffering from tachycardia, a very high heart rate. Doctors diagnosed him with fulminant hepatic failure, rhabdomyolysis, and acute renal failure. In other words, his liver was failing very quickly. His muscles were leaking into his bloodstream, and his kidneys were failing as well. All in all, a bad day, wouldn't you agree? The father still had some abdominal pain and diarrhea, but was otherwise completely fine. The son's condition, however, continued to worsen. At the University Hospital of Zurich, he wasn't able to respond to commands nor walk on his own. His pupils still responded to light, though, which is a win, however small. Doctors took some of the son's blood for examination, but no toxins that would trigger liver failure were found. Medical staff also tested the blood for any nefarious bacteria and fungi. However, those tests also came back negative. Doctors also determined that his liver failure was not connected to hepatitis, Epstein-Barr virus, or herpes. The son was immediately scheduled for a liver transplant and supportive treatment. Despite this, the boy developed a brain edema, which is when fluid builds up in the skull cavity, putting pressure on the brain. This pressure built up until his brain couldn't take any more. He died a day after arriving at the hospital. Now, I'm sure you've noticed some similarities between our cases already. In particular, both of the deceased and their families ate leftovers before coming down with symptoms. They both suffered forms of liver failure before their untimely deaths. But what could be behind this? The liver, in short, is the organ that controls the levels of particular chemicals in our bloodstream and removes any toxins or waste products. All the blood leaving your stomach and intestines after gobbling up all the nutrients from your food is filtered through the liver before going out to the rest of your body. It also converts various chemicals into forms that the rest of your body can use. So without it, your body is unable to get many of the nutrients it needs from your digestive system. Nutrients that your body needs to, you know, live. The autopsy on the young girl found cultures of bacteria called Bacillus cereus in her gut and her spleen. Medical staff also performed a liver biopsy and found that her liver was severely necrotic. The very cells that made up her liver were dying. Upon testing the food she'd eaten and her vomit, doctors found more cultures of B. cereus, lending credence to their theory that the foodborne pathogen had killed her. In short, bacteria in her food shut down her liver, taking her life. In the autopsy on the 17-year-old, after a liver biopsy, doctors found high concentrations of, you guessed it, B. cereus. Medical staff also found necrosis on his liver as well, which suggested an impairment of liver mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, due to B. cereus. Not only that, after testing his bile in the pan that reheated the spaghetti, staff found more B. cereus cultures. He succumbed to the same fate as the young girl. Bacteria in his food killed the cells in his liver, ending his life. But what is B. cereus, and how did it take the lives of two children? 
According to the British Columbia Center for Disease Control, B. cereus is a foodborne pathogen that can create two different toxins, which can trigger two kinds of illness. The first is an emetic toxin, which causes vomiting, and the second is a diarrheal toxin, which triggers, well, diarrhea. The emetic toxin causes vomiting almost immediately after ingestion, whereas the diarrheal only begins to wreak havoc once toxins are produced in the intestine. Symptoms of emetic syndrome include vomiting, nausea, and occasionally diarrhea as well. They usually appear between half an hour to five hours after eating contaminated food. The diarrheal syndrome triggers nausea and abdominal pain along with the diarrhea. Symptoms of diarrheal syndrome are more delayed compared to the emetic toxin, taking about eight hours to start showing. It should go without saying, but some cases are more severe than others. As we saw with both of our cases, your condition can deteriorate quickly. The young girl died within 13 hours, and the young man only two days after ingesting the contaminated food. If you have serious symptoms, you should speak with a doctor immediately. Bacillus cereus is a bacteria commonly found in soil and can be found on lots of different foods, including, but not limited to, meats, cereal, vegetables, milk, puddings, and soups. The tenaciousness of the bacteria is due to its production of heat-resistant spores, which can survive the cooking process. They are associated with starchy foods like pastas, grow in environments with pH levels more than 4.8, and temperatures between 8 and 55 degrees Celsius. That being said, not all strains of bacteria produce the toxin that actually causes food poisoning. In most cases, the reasons for bee serious poisoning are caused by improper food handling and storage. You can kill the spores of the bacteria by cooking at temperatures above 121 degrees Celsius. However, if you let your food sit out between 4 and 57 degrees Celsius, the bacteria can begin producing toxins once more. As always, you must store perishable foods properly. That is, cold food below 4 degrees and hot food above 57 degrees. Any amount of time food spends in the danger zone that is, between 4 degrees and 57 degrees Celsius, is time that foodborne diseases can take hold. It should be mentioned that of all foodborne diseases in the US, B. serious only accounted for 0.2% of all illnesses. Also, it's never recommended to eat anything that smells off. Reminding you all to store food properly seems obvious, but what is a little less clear is just how this bacteria control alt deletes your liver. In both of our cases above, the victim suffered from the effects of B. serious's emetic toxin, a little number called cyrillide. How cyrillide functions has actually been a mystery for a long time. The only method researchers knew to detect it used living primates, and the ethics of using our closest evolutionary cousins is questionable. However, recently better detection methods were developed that have allowed us to detail its structure more clearly. We do still have some way to go before we understand the biosynthetic pathway and mechanics of this toxin, but researchers discovered that cerulide affects the vagus nerve, the main controller of your parasympathetic nervous system, which controls some of the involuntary actions of our body, including digestion, heart rate, and the immune system. Cerulide causes vomiting because of its effect on the gastrointestinal vagal afferent fibers. These nerves transmit information about the status of your gastrointestinal tract to your brain, and they control the induction of nausea and vomiting. Cerulide causes more than vomiting, as we've seen in our cases. The really dangerous thing about B. serious is its toxin's effect on the liver. A study titled, Pathological Effect of Synthetic Cerulide, an Emetic Toxin of Bacillus Cereus is Reversible in Mice, looked at the effect of cerulide on mitochondria after administrating different levels of the toxin to mice. Their team found that cerulide works the same in mice as it does in human cases, at least as far as liver failure goes. They noticed damage in the liver within six hours of injecting the mice with their synthetic cerulide. They didn't see any damage to any other organs, however. In the liver itself, they found that cerulide damaged hepatocytes, the main functioning cells of the liver, forming about 80% of its mass. The extent of the damage is determined by the concentrations of cerulide consumed, but researchers found the effects of the toxin on mitochondria was the main cause of liver failure in their mice. Researchers wanted to learn if liver damage caused by cerulide is reversible. Fortunately, they found that poisoned tissue reverted to almost normal in about four weeks. If the load on their liver could be reduced, many patients would see improvements in their prognosis. 
Treatments for liver failure include medications that fight poisoning, relieve pressure in the brain, prevent bleeding, and nutritional support if your liver has been damaged such that it can no longer metabolize nutrients. As a last resort, done only when the damage is too far gone, doctors can also perform a liver transplant. Like most foodborne illnesses, your best protection is prevention. Storing all food at a safe temperature will make sure that no nefarious microscopic bacteria can grow. It's also just a general good rule of thumb to never eat anything that smells funny. Detecting smell is one of our body's many defense mechanisms, and we should be mindful when our bodies tell us that something isn't right. I'm sure that none of this is of any solace to the families of those who've passed away as a result of B. serious and serolide poisoning. Any death is a tragedy, but when it comes from such an innocuous place as some leftover pasta, it hurts so much more. One lapse of judgment or one mistake can be all it takes for a catastrophe to take hold. Remember, to smell your best, Scentbird is offering 55% off your first order using our coupon code BRUISE55, or click the link in the description below.